with Jeff Grosser and we've got three Rieslings here um, and uh, you've become something of like a, a Riesling superstar around the world and yeah why three what, what, are, the, what are the first two you've got that oh okay well these two uh, these two we this is a 30th release so uh, Polish Hill um, and Springvale Rieslings we've made for uh, 30 years and they represent um, I think really well um, or in a quite pure sense, the extremes that you can get from the Clear Valley. Um, Polish Hill is from um, a hard rock site, and I think that's not oversimplifying. It's the best way to describe it. It's got shale and then uh, slate underneath, and so the roots are, um, are quite challenged in, in you know trying to get down. And so the, the vine has to be kept smaller. Yeah. Um, so you end up with a smaller root system, smaller. Uh, Fine, um, and if you can keep, keep it in balance, you get uh, smaller berries and bunches. You sort of get an intensity that comes later, um, uh, sort of sometimes almost sort of lavender and uh, and honey um, characters, uh, uh, waxy characters later on this. Whereas this um, is probably what people see as more classic, so that's water vale, um, on the most prominent soil there, uh, rock profile, which is red loam on limestone, so it's a soft rock site. Um, and it's very reliable because the roots can get right down. So if we get dry season, you know, it's, it's still uh, not uh, vigorous, but uh, very reliable. Lovely green berries, taste, have got a fruit taste about them. And to me, it's reflected in the wine, a, a little bit more generosity, a little bit more early. I describe them in terms of profiles because I'm not so good on the descriptors, and this to me has got uh, some more generous fruit early, clean, crisp acidity, whereas to me the Polish Hill kicks in later on the palate. Uh, so just different profiles and uh, they, they look different from the first year, 1981, and I was a bit surprised and I thought, can't make a Clear Valley Riesling that's, uh, that, that's uh, complementary, that didn't work that way. They're so distinctive that I thought I'll just uh, make them separately. Um, and show people the difference and, uh, and they've really become I think an exercise of the importance of place now particularly for reason. <coughs> but the vineyards are pretty, I mean what, two kilometres apart? Yeah, only uh, be four or, five, oh, four, four or five maximum, yeah, very close. So what's the new member of the Riesling family? So then after uh, 30 years um, um, in fact in the, in the 1980s I, I, I uh, made uh, some late harvest wines and uh, there was an assumption I think uh, by many people certainly in Australia that uh, sweet uh, meant cheaper uh, more straightforward cheaper wine and so I thought they were lovely wines but there weren't enough other people that thought that um, so what I've found since is that I've always uh, loved Riesling from bone dry like these are through to uh, very sweet, very concentrated, you know, trochanter and isolases or whatever. So to me, the, the variety is so well suited to all of those uh, expressions. Um, and I think now things have changed in that um, my only concern is that provided the producer lets the consumer know what's going to happen, um, uh, the idea of an off-try reasoning uh, with the subtle change in culture that's occurred in Australia in particular, like a lot of Asian food influence, for example. But certainly that sort of fresh emphasis on, <coughs> excuse me, on fresh food and um, more spice, so Asian influence, um, and with our climate, I think off dry works really well. Uh, it was critical though that uh, I think that I, I wanted to, um, it's, it's hardly noticeable the sweetness, it just adds another dimension. So it has the acidity to balance. So it's all about balance. And I thought, well, it's probably time that we do that because um, we messed around for three years to see whether it was possible in the Clare Valley, which is a, uh, in, in terms of great regions in the world, we're at the warmer end. Uh, like Mosul would be at one end and we're at the other end. And so we've always converted that uh, lovely, you know, warmer climate and sunshine into more generous bone dry wines. Could we do you know, a wine like this and off dry? Um, uh, and so we had to change our viticulture. Um, we dedicated a vineyard to it and we changed the viticulture to achieve it, but I think that that's what we've done. And I think that this is a, just a lovely wine with 
um, a range of foods um, and, and, and I think fits a demand that's there now because um, there are a lot of people, particularly younger people, that don't have the prejudice. They don't link sweetness with any deterioration in quality. And so if we could just put out an outstanding example of that, I think it's great for the variety and I think for the diversity that's coming out of this region. Yeah, well it tastes pretty good and uh, I mean it's, it, it's, have you any idea, you see it as an early drinking wine, maybe the, the certainly the Polish Hill, more yeah. of a keeper. Um, but the, yeah. maybe the other two, they're the ones while you you drink while you're waiting for Polish Hill to mature. Uh, sure, um, it can be. It's funny that it's two things have happened there. Um, I think it looks lovely for now, and I've and and uh, that's been the, the general response. Is really why keep it? I guess the balance is there, which is what we work on with all of them. Um, but the analysis with a pH of 2.87 and an acidity of 9.2 and sweetness of 16, uh, everything suggests that the wine would age for 25 years. So we've got this. Um, so the short is uh, that I don't know. That's the best one. And if you love it now, I'd say drink it. Um, but maybe keep a bottle or two. That's because there are some suggestions that it could be a 20, 25 year proposition. I'll come back in 25 years and find out. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.